Thank you all so much for coming to the Middle Geeks podcast at AwesomeCon. Welcome. So, some of y'all might know the Middle Geeks. We are a podcast that covers all things Swana media and pop culture. We're part of the Hard Knock Life, i.e. Nerds of Color podcast network. So, please check out our show and all the other shows on there. And, hey, maybe give us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Suara Sala. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Middle Geeks. I'm a writer and podcaster on all things pop culture. Uh, my name is Ali Nasser. I am an actor, voice talent, and writer. Uh, my name is Roxana Haddadi. I'm a critic for Vulture and New York Magazine. I'm Zaina Ujaili. I study media of Muslims and Arabs in grad school, and I'm a screenwriter. My name is Daria Majestani. Um, by day, uh, I work uh, in pharmacy. I'm an intern pharmacist. And by night, um, I work in animation production, character design, and storyboarding. Um, unfortunately, our co-host, uh, May Abdelbaki, couldn't be here, but she's here in spirit. We love you, May. And yeah, today we're going to talk about the overall state of SWANA representation in pop culture. So first off, what do we mean by SWANA? You may know it as the Middle East and North Africa. And the term SWANA means Southwest Asia and North Africa. So, you know, basically uh, the Middle East, uh, but sort of reclaiming our West Asian heritage. And something before we start, I really want to emphasize to everyone is that the SWANA region is extremely diverse. Not only Arabs and Persians, but also my people, Kurds, Lors, uh, Amazi, uh, Armenians, Azeris, um, Afro-Arabs, Afro-Iranians, and just like a really rich, diversity of ethnicities and religions, not only Islam, but Christianity, Judaism, Druze, um, Yazidis, um, so many other, or Copts, like so many other religions in the area. And you would think that with such a rich tradition of cultures that we would have diverse media, but no, instead we mostly get this. <laughs> So there's so much we could dig into on the history of swan of representation in Western media, but you know, Daria, I first want to go to you. What really strikes out at you as a designer when you're looking at these? Um, well, you know, working in animation production and character design, um, it's one of the first markers of culture that we experience from our home as children. So um, one thing that really sticks out to me um, is that if you look back on the Disney princesses, all of them tend to be very young teenagers, and Jasmine is the same age, if not younger, than the other Disney princesses, but wears more revealing clothing, um, and is, number one, is also modeled after a white woman, <laughs> uh, and um, you know has that sweetheart neckline, uh, lower necklines, exposed midriff, even though that's not um, congruent with a lot of different styles from West Asia, um, and of course her seduction scene with uh, Jafar and Aladdin. Um, despite her being a teenager and him being an adult. So it's a very, um, it's our, our first exposure is to, in Orientalism and media, for cartoons especially, is either that sexualization or a sense of terror. Yes, and among other franchises, such as in Indiana Jones, a really popular one, you have like the original films, or the original film of Raise the Lost Ark having this uh, white man, Terry Richards, put on brown face, played an Arab swordsman. You have this uh, white man, uh, Jonathan Rhys Davies, still playing the character Sala, who's supposed to be Egyptian. At the very least, in the latest movie, you did have like a Moroccan actor play uh, Rahim, but he was uh, this raging uh, guy chasing after his ex-lover, like with a sword. So not <laughs> that much. Uh, improvement, but you know, Ali, for yourself as a North African Egyptian actor, what's your response like still seeing that we get this? Uh, I mean, it's not for a lack of opportunities that are presented to us. Like, I mean, it's it's sort of like the lack of good material, but also sort of like the the idea that you know we as actors, like there there's a whole like bunch of actors that are out there like who are from the Middle East, from North Africa, and sort of like we're always in the casting and director's office. But then sort of like you know, I mean, Indiana Jones as a franchise is sort of like being kind of like a franchise that was established in the '80s, so sort of like coming from a different time where sort of like different notions about like what like that it was. They were not as so conscious about diversity or representation back then as they are today. I think there were efforts in time in trying to rectify that today, but there's also still that idea of, you know, 
the franchise is, is itself in itself is sort of like focusing on othering other cultures and sort of like having the lead be like a white archaeologist who goes to like exoticize these like other cultures. So I think like maybe Indiana Jones at, like as a franchise maybe sort of like not the best example, but I would probably say like you know there are bad examples, there are good examples. Hopefully we'll get to discuss more about like the other ones that are out there that are more positive. Absolutely. And as to the reason why we still had so many bad examples, it really comes to this one major O word, which we're going to let this video explain to y'all. Oh, apologies, like uh, the sound isn't the best. But um, technical difficulty, so instead of this video, I'm just going to explain what Orientalism is. Essentially, it is a stereotyping of like peoples from across um, Swana and South Asia and East Asia, very often oversimplifying them in depictions like we showed before that uh, just don't represent the diversity and richness of our cultures. And this was a term coined by the late, oh, whoops, sorry, uh, by the late great Edward Said. And I'm going to read a quote here from him. Orientalism can be discussed and analyzed as a corporate institution for dealing with the, quote, Orient. Orientalism as a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. So, Rocky, I'd like to ask you, as a uh, critic and analyst of all these films and TV, how do you think Orientalism still plays into this subjugation of the Swana region and elsewhere? I like that I got the most like academic question, <laughs> the most like explain this college concept to this audience. Um, well, I think the thing about Orientalism is essentially, and Said was an academic and a sociologist, and he talked about this. It is predominantly a way to like divide the world into sections, right? So, like an Orientalist perspective will inherently always consider this part of the world as other, and will invent ways to maintain its otherness. Um, and I think probably the best way that we could see this. Uh, and a recent example would be something like Wonder Woman 1984, um, which is set in the 80s and is set in Egypt uh, and presents Egypt at that time as like a monarchy. <laughs> it basically like invents an entirely different history uh, for Egypt in the 1980s. Uh, and so it is really playing into this idea of we need Wonder Woman to come to this place to save this country from itself. Uh, when in reality, Egypt was like modernized and like totally fine. Um, but that is essentially sort of that idea in action. It is like a American or a Western perspective uh, creating or engineering ways to maintain the Middle East as being like backwards or exotic or over sexualized or flattened into like a generic Muslim presentation. Absolutely, and Orientalism itself often leads to the often unspoke of aspect of cultural appropriation. When you look at one of the most famous franchises in film history, Star Wars, George Lucas literally took the name Tatooine from the city of Tatooine in Tunisia, where he filmed. Uh, so much so, to, and took other things, so much so to the extent that in an article written by our friend Hannah Flint, uh, who is Tunisian-British, uh, she noted that there's an Arabic word in a certain dialect, al-jedi, meaning master of the mystical warrior way. <laughs> it literally is, the word Jedi is taken straight from Arabic. And Zaina, I'd love to ask you about your thoughts on why this is so still prevalent. Yeah, I think especially in science fiction, we have this idea that the Middle East has become such a common kind of place for writers to draw inspiration that it becomes something that people almost see as invisible. Like, of course, you're going to have these desert landscapes and these like hooded people and they're going to speak in Arabic words. And it's just become this idea of like a forever frontier of what the Middle East will always look like in science fiction. And frequently that inspiration is not credited. So I think what's important to note is, you know, especially like as writers, as creators, I know you guys are a lot of creative people in this room. You know, the lesson is it's not bad to take inspiration from other places, but in 2024, it's really important that when we take inspiration, we also give back. That means making space at the table, inviting people into the conversation, 
because it's true that especially in science fiction, even though there's so much swan of, you know, aesthetics, music, cultural ideas within present in science fiction, people and creators who are swan of background are frequently absent in these films and in these conversations. Speaking of being absent, um, at least at the forefront, we have the Dune franchise, which um, takes much from our cultures. Um, what you see on the right is an Amazigh North African woman in her traditional garb, and then you have Swedish actress Rebecca Ferguson dressed in the same garb for the movie. Um, although I will say, you know, Rocky was on our recent Dune 2 review where we talked about this, where how the appropriation is kind of inherent to Frank Herbert's text. Can you elaborate more on that, Rocky? Yeah, I mean, uh, appropriation is the point of Dune. I, I think to say that, like, Dune appropriates the Middle East is it's like, yeah, you got it. Like, you got the point. Um, but I think the larger point is something that Zana talked about, which is, like, the Dune films, and we don't have to, you know, do, like, a major analysis of Denny's motivations, but, like, the novel is very steeped in Middle Eastern and Muslim thinking uh, and how that shapes the Fremen to who they are and how Western thinking shapes House Atreides. Um, so to have that stripped from the film, I personally think, and I wrote about this, makes like the Fremen ideology feel incredibly hollow and Paul's heel turn feel unearned. Uh, we could talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Um, but yeah, I think this is the question of like, we have a film that is mimicking these aesthetics with no one in the writing staff, production design, costume design, any of that actually from this region. Um, give us jobs. It's like so easy just to do that. Like, please. If please I have to us. hear one more white person say, Lisan al Gayib. I know, that's pretty good. You're actually not saying it the way they say it. You know, like, Hassan and Ra'en, right? Like, sometimes yeah, you sure. have, you know, so it's interesting right. that you have a lot of these terminologies where, you know, it pulls directly Tiny from shot. Arabic. It translates directly from Arabic phrases, and yet and Farsi. it gets stripped away. Yeah, they, they kind of mix and match, you know? Yes. Um, so much so. And again, they don't have, I mean, I will give, and I did give Denis Villeneuve credit, credit in the second film that at least there were North African actors at least in the background, you know, as like, even so, only being supporting when you have Javier Bardem in brown face playing like a clearly North African Muslim coded character. Um, by the way, don't worry, we're not getting into spoilers about Dune, um, including the Q&A. That's actually deployment. exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, again, Ali, like, um, you saw like Dune too, and again, no spoilers, but um, just seeing like, Bardem play this role, I, yeah, what was your reaction? Uh, I mean, again, it's like, this isn't something like that is new to the industry. I mean, it's like, we've often had like stories, like even going back to say like the 13th Warrior with Antonio Banderas, where it's sort of like he was playing a Middle Eastern character. And that's so, and, like, and, and there could be something that could be said about like, you know, Andalusia being sort of like, you know, the heyday of like both Middle Eastern and Spaniard like representation and sort of like, there's somewhat, the cultures are interconnected, but still I feel like with this one, there's a little bit of a missed opportunity in, in terms of like casting and like, and especially, you know, uh, Javier Bardem, amazing actor as he is, like there, like there is so much like amazing talent that's available to the middle, uh, that's already available in like Arab and yeah, people who can speak Arabic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and people who know how to pronounce this and like pretty well and also sort of like, you know, understand the nuances of like what it what it takes to be sort of like Fremen and like ins take that as inspiration because again Herbert the, the main inspiration for that story was like you know the Amazigh warriors and sort of like the Tunisian Algerian uh, revolution so sort of like there's a lot of that uh, subtext in the text and sort of a lot but like there's a lot of Arab and like Middle Eastern and Muslim talent who can actually encompass that in their performance and uh, like a lot of them have been able to like break into like the mainstream recently so uh, it's sort of like again like I said missed opportunity with that one but now that we've covered the less savory aspects now we move on to the good we actually have good swan of representation that's come out recently um particularly like this film on Netflix the swimmers which is about 
real life Syrian sisters who are Olympic swimmers and Zaina, we reviewed it on the podcast and you know as a Syrian American yourself like watching this film what was it like for you? I mean it's amazing when you actually get to see a movie where they are human beings right like they have wants and they have needs and I mean I think it's just a beautifully crafted movie that isn't just about you know a certain lens or a certain stereotype about the Middle East and I think it really does I mean I spoke to Yusra Mardini who's you know the movie is based on and for her it's like the movie, the, the filmmakers and the director, like, listen to her, right? Like, they, they listen to what they have to say. And I think when you do that, when you kind of create space for conversation, you can also create beautiful movies. Absolutely. It's a great film. Please watch it on Netflix. Um, and we also have, like, this sort of um, genre in and of itself of, like, the immigrant family um, from Grammy, the Persian version, Amrika back in 2009, Mo, which is also on Netflix. You have like more stories coming out now. You know, the immigrant uh, intergenerational trauma uh, story is like very common, including for us now. And I guess, um, Rocky, like uh, you saw the per you saw the Persian version. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did that resonate for you? Oh man, this is a loaded question because I have very mixed feelings about this movie. Yikes. Um, <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> uh, the only thing that I will say uh, is that I think that these stories are, again, like to what was just said, not just about the trauma. And that's the step forward, that they can be immigrant stories, stories about starting over, that yes, are inherently about like, hey, there is racism and a lot of it sucks. Um, and also being like, what do your families bicker about? And what are holidays like? And what happens when you bring home the person you're dating? Like it is more in the realm of your average sitcom or your average coming of age story than something that is maintained as uh, outside of the norm of everyday experience. Absolutely, to have more variety across TV and film, sure. such as our very own Ali Nasser, who just starred in <laughs> Law and Order Organized Crime. Let's give a round of applause. For our <laughs> I mean, he, the character isn't necessarily like a good guy. Like he's basically like an emerald smuggler, like posing as a surgeon, a cash and gash doctor, as the show attributes it. But I mean, again, so sort of like in terms of talking about like positive and negative representation for this one, it's like it. it I think like it's sort of like an evolution where sort of like yes, Middle Easterns can play bad guys too, and like especially bad guys that aren't like that that don't use religion or faith as their crutch for their villainy. So I think like that was kind of like a nice change of pace. Although I mean again like playing a villain and especially like when there isn't like that much of an abundance for like positive role models in in media is sort of like. It's a little bit discouraging, but hopefully, like with the pre with the good representation, like the slide that we had previous, where we talked about shows like Mo and and Rami, like hopefully, like there's a lot more opportunities for us to play, like or present ourselves in a more positive light. Yeah, speaking of, um, this was an example Rocky brought up Nandor uh, from <laughs> What We Do in the Shadows. I still need to watch. I feel bad about it, but you should feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> But yeah, like tell me why. Why is Nandor like great? Uh, Nandor is great because he is a sexually voracious vampire warlord who uses a wish from a genie to bring his thirty-seven wives back to life, and some of the wives are men. I, I mean, it's just a very uh, different presentation of a character who is of Iranian origin. He's like a little bit of an idiot. He's a little bit of a himbo. He was a warlord, so he has killed like thousands of people. But he's just, he's just a fun warlord. And uh, you know, there's something about that that is uh, very charming in that the tone is humorous, while there also still being episodes that are very heartfelt. There is an episode about how he has forgotten Persian and his ghost returns because his ghost has a mission that he needs to complete to go on to the afterlife and Nandor realizes that he's forgotten Persian but his ghost only speaks Persian so how are the two of them going to communicate like what did he lose by forgetting his home language 
Um, so there, you know, and this is a diverse cast. There is a actress who plays the character Nadja, who is Greek, and there are a lot of episodes that deal with like her Greek heritage, including the fact that her village was once warlorded by Nandor. So there are fun ways, I keep saying fun, but there are, you know, there are ways that are not incredibly like emotionally weighty, devastating ways to talk about culture and faith and heritage and religion. And this show does it very well. The final season airs this summer. You have time to catch up. Absolutely. Um, more in the sci-fi and fantasy space, like there have been more Swanic characters. Um, you have Khalid Nasur, who's in Young Vs. Phantoms. Leila Al-Fawli, played by our Palestinian Egyptian Queen May, Queen May Kalamawi in Moon Knight. Uh, Ezra Bridger, uh, played by Iman Esfandi, and Zari, played by Tala Ash, and Beth Raj, Shine Sofian, and DC's Legends of Tomorrow. And yeah, I think we're, you know, these are still like few and far between, but we are sort of reaching into this space a lot of us have loved so much. So, um, you know, like uh, Daria, someone who's watched like a lot of, um, you know, superhero and sci-fi stuff yourself, like, what's your reaction to this? Um, I think we're, it, it, progress can feel slow, and I feel like the getting where we want to be as a society even is a constant struggle, but the fact that we've been materially been able to move the needle is just amazing. And it's like, what, like Cartoon Network has a short coming out like this year about Armenian vampires, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I live in this reality where uh, things are definitely not perfect, they're far from perfect, but um, definitely we are moving the needle, needle in media and um, you know, starting to have our experiences authentically represented, uh, not just as a monolithic uh, one, one size fits all, but also across the genres, something as crazy as vampires, superheroes, you know, horror, psychological thriller, etc. It is really beautiful, and I see that in animation too, which makes me really happy. Um, there's also something I want to say, which is, uh, I feel like uh, I'm being greedy by saying this, but, but the goal also, at a certain level, is to have like Middle Eastern actors play characters who their heritage is not integral to the character, but it's still a step forward for representation. I say all this because in Blade Runner 2049, the leader of the Replicant Revolution is played by Hiem Abbas from Rami and from Succession. Wait. And like... Thank you. Denny did like one thing right, and it was cast <laughs> this Palestinian actress to play the leader of the Replicant Uprising. That's actually tight as hell, and uh, I wanted to make sure we talk about that. Absolutely. And you know, while we have the heroes, we also have the villains. You know, we here, where we have Ras Al Ghul, his daughter Talia Al Ghul, um, this character from Legion. I'm sorry, I forget his name. Uh, Shadow King. Yeah, or Amal Farouk. Shadow King and Isaac from Castlevania. Zayna mentioned that. Yeah, they tell us about Isaac, uh, Zayna. Isaac is kind of a fun character because he's Muslim and he draws a lot of his kind of theology from like Sufism. And so it's an interest. He takes like a villainous turn, but he's what's I think important about Isaac is that he's a complicated character. And that's kind of what we're asking for. No one's saying that you have to cast your, you know, Swana. Um, and your Muslim characters to only be, you know, heroes and goody two shoes. No, what we want is kind of complicated characters that people can kind of fall in love with and get behind and kind of feel captivated by their stories. And I think Isaac is an example of one of those characters. Your emerald smugglers. My, the the emerald smugglers. <laughs> need more emerald smugglers. Your surgeons who smuggle emeralds. Oh boy. Maybe we need like a uh, Middle Eastern Narcos. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. that's fine. Let's do it. Um, yeah, but uh, Ali, tell us about uh, this character from Legion. Yeah, so, like, Sh Shadow King from the comics is sort of like, you know, he's um, an arch nemesis to uh, Charles Xavier, but also mm -hmm. sort of like, you know, an antagonist as well. His origins are kind of like very, very, he's coded in Middle Eastern, but uh, like his origins come from Middle Eastern region. And he dabbles in like forces such as the Jinn and also kind of like a shapeshifter. So, there's like uh, it, it, there's a the character itself is rooted in like Middle Eastern mythology, so I feel like and the show Legion did such an amazing job, like a casting Naveed Nagaban as the as the character, but also kind of like rooting some of that like visual imagery and mythology into the show as well. Absolutely. Um, one other example that has at least two Swana characters is We Are Lady Parts, an amazing show on Peacock. Please 
watch this show. Um, diverse Muslim woman in Britain having a punk rock band. It's amazing. Nita Manzor is a genius. Um, I also want to state Nita Manzor is at least a quarter Iraqi as well as Pakistani, so we can claim her. <laughs> um, but yeah, Rocky, tell us uh, why. I like how um, we're doing this whole, like, yeah. we should be really tolerant and accepting. And also, we're going to claim this woman. <laughs> <laughs> because she's a genius. She's amazing. But We're taking her. <laughs> Call Liam Neeson. Um, <laughs> We Are Lady Parts is very fun. It's like a six episode series on Peacock. Uh, just about this punk rock band. I don't know what else there is to say. It's just a great coming of age story. If you like to bend it like Beckham, this has a pretty kick ass soundtrack and gives you those same feelings. And I mean, you can blow through it in a weekend and you should. Absolutely. Also, check out Polite Society by Nina Olsen, which I think is on Amazon Prime. Um, and then we. Uh, Reference our queen, Shora Agdashlu, uh, playing uh, UN Secretary General Chris Jen, forget her last name, but um, on The Expanse and. Voicing a dragon this weekend in Damsel. Ooh, oh, yeah. yeah. Shora's sure. great. Yeah, no, she, she really has like just paved the way so much for many in our community to just have these opportunities. And I think, yeah, just gotta give a shout out to her. Uh, I also want to talk about the comic side and independent creators there y'all if you're interested in swan representation read squire by nadia shamas and sada al -Fanji. it is one of the absolute best depictions of a fantasy swana uh, story i've ever seen in any media uh, nadia is amazing check out our interviews with her on the middle geeks um and here's just some of the art from squire um showing showing um like a pe a Petra informed like uh, structure that you, you find in Jordan and it's just mesmerizing. Please, I cannot emphasize enough, read Squire. Um, but also, our very own Daria, like that was an This is Daria's art, it's great. Yes. Thank you, I really appreciate it. And um, I, I know while things aren't really being gr greenlit that much in animation because of, you know, they're going on strike soon and uh, because of the mergers, um, I do see uh, a lot more receptiveness um, to my, you know, detailed research um, and a lot more uh, consideration uh, for my expertise. So I feel like I love just being a part of that momentum uh, in improving the quality of the landscape of SWAT representation in media. <laughs> it takes all angles. And you cover like so many diverse cultures in your art. Like, what really prompted you to do that? Um, I feel like just the nature of West Asia and North Africa as a whole, it's, um, borders are made up, basically, and they're, it's a social contract between humans, but often in uh, West Asia we find that, um, you know, people intermingled, um, I'm also bicultural, my mom is uh, Iranian Jewish, or her family is Iranian Jewish, and my dad is, uh, his family is from Turkmenistan, but they're Iranian Turkmens. And I mean, coming from a bicultural um, family is just like, how could I not? And you know, you have all these tribes in history uh, living together, different ethnic groups live together or in nearby towns, and there's no really sense of borders, so to speak, in the modern concept. So I love embracing that, and it really shifts your worldview. Absolutely. You know, speaking as a Kurd myself, um, I understand the history of our people and how we were displaced, but how also, frankly, we were involved in displacement. You know, the Ottoman Empire resettled us in areas where there are Armenians and, like, historic Armenia. And, like, so much of that, makes, that's a whole other panel, but I just wanted to, yeah, talk about that quickly. Other books you should check out, uh, We Hunt the Flame by Hafsa Faisal. I actually haven't read it yet, but I've heard nothing but amazing things. Uh, she's a uh, Saudi, um, I believe, uh, Sri Lankan, American, Muslim uh, author, really amazing work. Uh, Chelsea Abdullah is a Kuwaiti American author whose debut, The Stardust Thief, is amazing. This is the, I just wanna say, we have Jin way too much in like Orientalist media, but this is Jin done right from an actual Arab author. So highly recommend The Stardust Thief. You're saying that Melissa McCarthy's genie doesn't count? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and uh, the last thing I'll recommend before we get into Q&A is Assassin's Creed Mirage, absolutely incredible, 
It is the best depiction of Baghdad I've ever seen in anything. Just the richness, the tapestries of the culture that's presented, best Muslim representation, best Iraqi representation, best um, Arab representation. I've ever seen video games, certainly. And if you haven't played it yet, you need to check it out. And with that, uh, we're gonna go on to Q&A. So please uh, line up if you have any questions, if there's anything you'd like to have. We got 15 minutes. All right. No, no. All right. Um, Salam alaikum. Um, Salam. Uh, Salam. Salam. I'm a third culture kid. My dad worked for Xerox, so he moved us, moved us all over the place, and I wound up living in Morocco and Egypt towards the end. I graduated from Cairo American College in Cairo, Egypt. Oh, so, cool. Nice. Um, my question is, of in the past 10 years, of all the, now we're finally seeing people of, from the Swana area have actually rep represented. For all of you, is there, which one of, is sort of went, had like a squee moment for like, oh my god, that's me. Be it acting, be it in movies, TV, comic books, whatever. Anyone want to go first? Someone go first. <laughs> All Running right. time here. I'm I mean, just I have to admit, like, I haven't, okay. I don't know if it's like an I'm me moment, but like in We Are Lady Parts, if you guys haven't seen it, one of the songs is There's a Voldemort Under My Headscarf. So. <laughs> oh my god, like, there's something about it when you're you're seeing it where it was just it, it just like brought me back to like high school like as a Harry Potter nerd I, I went to high school in Saudi Arabia like but we still love Harry Potter right like there's kind of you know a, a nuance there that's like so exciting where you're like oh yeah I, I kind of see some of that you know in yourself mm -hmm. yeah that's that's what I really love about we are late parts and how it you know it's informed by the identities of these characters but it also just engages with the racism that they face in a very bold and direct and sarcastic manner. Like basically being like, we don't give an F, we're going to make you uncomfortable with our music. And that is so empowering that it breaks against like a model minority. Like uh, There's a scene in We Are Lady Parts where they are screaming along to System of a Down's toxicity. <laughs> and System of a Down, great brown person representation. So that's mine, when they <laughs> scream along to that song and make other people uncomfortable. Indeed. Anyone else? No? Um, I'm probably just, I mean, I'm gonna go for the obvious, like Rami. Um, yeah, Rami. Yeah. Although it's like, I mean, it, the character of Rami itself is not one that I probably find like someone that I gravitate towards, but I feel like the, dyna the dynamics of the family itself like yeah. reminds me so much of like my, like growing up in Egypt, but also sort of like, you know, having Egyptian parents and also sort of like the kind of conversations that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. So like definitely seeing that on an American TV show was... The Rami 9-11 episode. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Where he still has to go to school and all of his friends are like, yeah. so are you a terrorist or what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that for sure. Oh, when Fernando is listing his wives from the past, one of them is named Daria, Daria, my nice. name. And I was like, oh my god, that's me! <laughs> <laughs> he did the Leo pointing meme. Yeah. <laughs> after, after years of not being able to find my name at a keychain in a gift shop, it finally happened. <laughs> Next question. Hey, thank you guys so much for a great panel. I learned so much because I'm also like, always trying to kind of get more information. As, um, so I'm a, my name is Sasha, I'm a pop culture commentator. I work on the Jewish representation side of things. So thank you so much for shouting out Iranian Jewry and uh, Kurdish Jewry. Um, but my question is a little bit more in depth. I'm curious because you guys mentioned that we're seeing uh, this wonderful increase in quality representation while still seeing some of the not so great representation. What do you think is fueling the positive representation? Is it new opportunities? Is it like more in the US, more in the UK, more in uh, Middle Eastern cinema? Like what's driving this wonderful increase in positive representation? That's a great question. I mean, Evelyn Osultani is a, a Muslim culture critic, and so something that she's looked at is actually a lot of positive representations of Muslims happened after the Muslim ban, which is kind of a, a surprising thing that we would think about, but I think part of the reason that happened is because it called people's attention to that, right, in a really extreme way, and suddenly you had creators saying, okay, we don't agree with this, and so we actually want to reach out to kind of our Muslim counterparts. We want to address this problem, because it became visible in a way that I think Hollywood wasn't seeing it as being very visible, or at least didn't care. Um, so, I mean, that's not saying like, guys, use another Muslim band so we can get hired, but like... That's actually exactly what she said. Um, <laughs> please, please excerpt that and put it on the internet. It's basically to say that like, when we pay attention to representation, right. we end up, we can actually 
throw the needle forward when the needle doesn't move forward when there's just apathy, when it's just, oh yeah, whatever, representation, we're not gonna pay attention to it, we're not gonna listen. Um, the thing that I would say that also I think is like good and bad is a lot of the good representation that we talked about just comes from like a few creators. Like mm -hmm. Mo was on Rami, Rami co-created Mo, there's an existing relationship there. Then a Mansoor did We Are Lady Parts and Polite Society. Like it is great that we can be like, Rami Youssef has given us four things, but Rami can't be the only guy. 100%. So like it's just that there's He doesn't there want needs... to be the only guy. No, he doesn't yeah. want to be the only guy. So there also just needs to be uh, more, and we are definitely like facing down a time when there's going to be less because the strikes are making executives blame the people striking, not themselves for not taking pay cuts for their billions of dollars in revenue. Um, but yeah, I think it's great that we are seeing like a few people who have made it and are pulling others up with them, but we just need more of those people to like create that network. Does anybody have anything they want to add? No. All right. Um, yeah, that's good. Thank you for your question. Hello. 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 Um, I was very, very, um, you'll hear it. Uh, so, when it comes to what has been represented before, it's definitely not known as much as it should, definitely not positive, mm -hmm. or like, oh, it's positive. How do you think both the contraction of like the merges and everything, but also with the rise of AI, because mm -hmm. it only depends on what was around before, how do you think that will affect representation in the future? We're free from the hologram that they didn't care about us to begin with. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go ahead and dive into this. I think that the uh, AI fad, which I'm going to go ahead and call it that, I think it's going to be very relatively short-lived and executives will realize like none of this will be anywhere near as good as having actual people write these and create these stories. Um, in terms of, uh, sorry, what was the second part of your question? Mergers? In Mergers, it? yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's very concerning. Uh, we need antitrust, uh, you know, and I think that ultimately we just need to be supporting independent creators. You know, we need to be supporting, for example, like Nita Munzor, you know, we've said her name a lot of times, but she is really doing the work in her independent projects. And Rami, Mo, others, uh, Nadia Shamas, like I mentioned earlier, they're doing absolutely fantastic work um, in comics. And just find independent creators you believe in whose stories resonate with you and support them any way you can. Because art uh, in general, unfortunately, is under attack from capitalism. Capitalism sucks in my opinion. It's at the root of so much harm in the world. And even though you know, we have to put up with it, it's a system in way it is, but use that tool to Again, prop up independent creators you believe in. I also think the reality is that, like, if you live in DC, we do live in an area that supports a lot of, like, film festivals. Absolutely. And, like, the AFI often has, like, uh, like a Middle Eastern film festival, or they do, like, an Iranian film festival every year in conjunction with the Smithsonian. So, like, there are also, you know, like, these avenues which, yes, are, like, specialty art house theaters <laughs> and like maybe a streaming service you haven't heard of or like signing up for your library but there are I think like we live in a place that has really like encouraged a lot of this and I think that you can like find these people or find someone who resonates with you um, and we live in a place that really supports that so anybody else um, I feel like it's important to think about how uh, AI generated art it can't research it can't have Right. trauma, <laughs> you know, racialized trauma. Uh, it can't do a, like a turnaround for character design that um, has to be in your portfolio if you want to get hired for a character design um, position on any animation production. And combined with, um, I guess, our flares from our life experiences and our cultures, it's just something that cannot, physically cannot be emulated. So if they actually cared in the first place, it, it's not an issue. And it kind of exposes that, do they actually care or not? <laughs> Next question. Hi everyone, thank you all for your expertise. I'm like blown away by <laughs> all of your backgrounds and everything, so thank, thank you. Um, I'm independently like writing a graphic novel and I am really wanting to make sure that the representation of all my characters are connected and are not just a shell, you know? Like I'm not just putting, you know, like certain types of characters like just 
making them look a certain way just to be like, oh, there we go, there's the diversity. Like in my cast, I actually want it to be based on and connected to and inspired by like real, you know, um, real culture uh, so that it, it speaks. And I think one of the, the, the places that I'm sort of struggling with and I'm coming to you seeking advice for and perspective is how to like make sure that I'm researching in such a way that I'm being inspired by and writing and designing characters that actually feel real and that have like a rich background in history and that they're not just like, okay, here is like a, the diversity quotient, but actually nothing about it. It's like a shell of a character, mm -hmm. basically. Do, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So how do I make them rich, you know? Like, could, yeah. where do I start? So I'd love any perspective that you could offer there. I guess as a, like as a writer, like I, I totally feel you. Because even when I'm sitting down to write a screenplay, I have the same problems where you sit down and you're like, how am I gonna make this person feel like an actual person? And it's the same way that you would write any character. The only difference is trying to sit down and maybe spend time with members of the community, with spending some time with like actually like reading texts and talking to people. Like book like scholarship is gonna get you only so far. You know, you're gonna really wanna just have conversations with people. And then also like if there's a character, say for example, you wanted to like do like a Syrian Arab woman, and you wanted to, to put a character like that in your, your graphic novel, great. Reach out to someone, get their opinions, yeah. create, make it a conversation. And then it doesn't have to feel like you're trying to like impose this whole reality. Yeah. The thing that I'll say about uh, brown people is we're incredibly talkative about ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so if you wanna like reach out to someone, they probably will be like, sure, I'll give you my life story and a meal. Yeah, we'll, we'll take you to restaurants, we'll take you yeah, 100%. To show you our best food. I will also say, like, consume the media of Swana, Muslim people, you know, like we've recommended, and even beyond. You know, we've only covered, like, what we could for this panel, and the stories are out there, and when you, like, absorb it, it's not like you're copying or anything like that, but rather you're informing, genuinely inspired, because all art is in conversation with each other. Some of my friend Preeti Chipper says a lot. She's an amazing author. Um, so yeah, like consume a lot of our media as well. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another thing. I feel like there's a certain universal beauty that comes with specificity. Yes. Um, a lot of great characters. I know, um, oh, sorry to bring up Family Guy, but I know there are sort of some characters that people get a, get a rise out of. And some of those were actually based on um, Seth MacFarlane's friend group as a child, and if you're engaged in these types of communities, even if it's just among other artists who happen to be Swana or happen to be like literally any ethnicity, capturing a sense of specificity gives the, to your audience, it's like, oh, I know that guy. That feels like a real person I've interacted with. Yeah. That is a member of my community, right? Yeah. So there's, think about specificity as a means of capturing someone you know, or elements of someone yeah. you know in our community, like that will take you a really long way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. All right, yeah, we're going to talk about Dune. Are doing it? <laughs> <laughs> Who has questions about Dune? Um, my friend Bobby Yara is covering her ears. <laughs> Do uh, any mom. other questions? Anyone else? <laughs> You know, I will just, uh, you know, keep blabbering on about Assassin's Creed Mirage and that, at <laughs> that point. Like, uh, it's just, it's so beautiful. It's so well done. The I love how Squara is like, I want to be optimistic. And she's like, <laughs> dude. <laughs> <laughs> how much time do we have left? We got two minutes left. Does everybody just want to say, like, one recommendation? Sure, yeah. Okay. That's how we end our podcast usually, yeah, so that's fair. a good idea. Okay. Should um, not be. Yeah, Barry, right, you first. <laughs> Um, oh my god, uh, I, <laughs> give me a second, all right, um, not Family Guy, <laughs> um, there's this comic called Corto Maltese, uh, you know, Jack Kirby and a lot of famous, uh, comic artists were inspired by this comic, it's an Italian comic from the 70s, but it touches a lot on, uh, Central and West Asian culture, on Kurdish populations, Druze, Uzbeks, um, Iranians, and uh, it, it's, it centers around uh, a protagonist who's a Jewish sailor who's also Romani. Um, so definitely, definitely read Corto Montes. It's amazing. There's also a movie. So, and it's amazing. One of the best animated movies ever. <laughs> um, I might, if you haven't already watched it, the present short film on Netflix. Mm -hmm. You know yeah, about 
you know, that's, it's about life in Occupied Palestine, and I think it's, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's Emory Regis who did it, and I don't know, it's really, it doesn't take too much of your time, literally only like, I think it's like 25 minutes long, beautiful film, so that's what I would shout out. Um, I actually, with no facetiousness whatsoever, would recommend that you read too. <laughs> <laughs> Because, <laughs> uh, I don't know, I mean, Frank Herbert was like a uh, Reagan conservative, but setting all that aside, uh, I do actually think the book is like incredibly well researched and a really fascinating consideration of like what terms like uh, jihad and messiah and these other concepts that we've sort of like seen uh, flattened in the film what they would actually mean in a culture uh, that is struggling to survive against oppression. So in literally like all seriousness, I, I would recommend that you read Dune. Um, well, this is kind of like a bit of a plug, but uh, there's this book that I just did the audiobook for called uh, Behind You is the Sea yes. by Suzanne Moabdi Darraj. Uh, she's a Palestinian author and the story, it, it tells the story of three Palestinian American families who are based in Baltimore and sort of like their own struggles with sort of like, you know, accl acclimating to American culture, but also sort of like the inter intragenerational struggle between like the, the seniors of family and the young ones. And it's such a, like a profound and amazing story. I had such an amazing honor. Uh, I like read it with another actor, uh, actress, Russia Zalamiri, who does an amazing job with it as well. It, it's such an amazing story. It broke me near the end, so I highly recommend everyone read that. I just started it. It's such a great book. Mm -hmm. um, Suzanne is a great author. Um, I don't know. I, know. I feel like I gave like a lot of my recommendations at the end of this panel. So I'm just gonna say again, read Squire. It's amazing. It's so like uh, definitive for what Swan representation can be in pop culture and literature and Nadia Shamas and Sada Fachi are brilliant and that will do it for this panel and thank you all so much for showing up today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to the NOC in full color you see me the hard knock